So my job, of course, is to get you to talk about what's what. And Donna did such a spectacular job of showing us how this impacts families. And I think earlier we suggested maybe the program could use a patient family advisory group just to bounce things off of and to get some ideas. But my own feeling is this is a unique opportunity to actually look at the psychological dimensions of what families go through. I remember years ago thinking probably you could classify them kind of into 10 groups and then you could give the right counseling at that time for those groups. But clearly without a diagnosis, with a diagnosis and no, nothing to do with it, already part of support groups, I mean there's some very specific classifications for families and to start to look at how they deal depending on their classification um, could be something really useful. You all know there are support groups. The Alliance brings them together. But as Donna suggested, they do very different things. And so also looking at the support groups and thinking how they can be our partners and educate each other may be useful things. So let's open it for discussion. What would we really like to learn from and give back to um, the families who take part. I, 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 was, I was just going to say, listening to various uh, interventions and, and from, from the, the mom, as you call yourself, you know, I, I was thinking of my, my own uh, involvement with families in the field of disorders of sex development, and I'm the <coughs> PI of, of another network that's NICHD funded. And we do have an advisory uh, network with patients representative on it, and they're actually on the leadership calls, and they're on the, uh, which would be equivalent to the steering committees, and and it's been great. I was thinking, however, that it's not always warm and fuzzy. Maybe because of the topic, which is probably one of the most contentious topics in 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 pediatrics, which is things about gender assignment and genital surgery. So there are a lot of frictions with, the, uh, with our uh, patients' representatives and because the, the goals are not necessarily the same all the time. You know, the, the scientists want to do science and they're like, oh, this family is interesting, not because it's, <laughs> not, not, not because we, you know, to be honest, just like just help them, but it's interesting because there's this really cool mutation. But of course, families with an ordinary mutation, yeah, like, okay, you know, it's not. So, so there is a lot of give and take, and it's, it, takes, it takes a lot of efforts from both parties to, to, to sort of uh, build common ground. So, I mean, I, I'm really uh, for the UDN to, to invest more efforts, probably it, 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 it requires funds to bring the family, those small organizations, they can't, they need to be traveled to, to steering committees and so forth, so. So just to um, put forward a proposal, would it be possible that each of the networks take some different psychological aspect and study it? Um, theoretically, if you get it set up, it wouldn't cost a huge amount of money, but is that something the networks have talked about doing? Or, or are there any uh, standardized um, tools that are being used to assess uh, well-being um, and how that might change over time? So, Rachel, are there, are there standardized psychological things? Yeah. Um, yes, so we have a, a couple of things going on, one of, one of which is the genetic um, counseling and testing outcome scale that assesses um, sort of feelings of empowerment before and after participating in the UDN and, and over time. And I know as part of, of John's um, U3 group, there, there are also aspects of, of looking at um, patient outcomes. Um, some of the things we, we do struggle with are, as we we're saying, we're, we're giving so many surveys and questionnaires to, to the patients uh, that we start to think, my goodness, are we just overburdening people in a, in a desire to do the right thing, but actually just overworking them. Um, and I think the, the second thing is um, 
you know, how, how much of our resources should we, should we focus on, for instance, looking at the psychological aspects? And, and I think some people in our network are, are very interested in this. And versus how, how much should we spend on making sure we are, what, what I view at least, as fulfilling our basic contract with, with our patients, that is making sure that the right information gets back to their clinicians and, and, and that we follow up on those aspects of their care um, with, with the great attention to detail. Sue? So I know this is set up with different centers having different responsibilities and, and is there any intrinsic reason why there can't be some overarching questions that one center takes charge of and interrogates all the centers of? For example, this kind of thing. Because so somebody, somebody, one of the centers had somebody who was very expert in family and social dynamics. This would be a really unique group of patients under which um, you could get a lot of information from this group of um, centers as opposed to an individual center. So by definition, they don't have a diagnosis, so we don't know whose fault it is. So you could do some studies before you know whose fault it is. Rachel? I, I just want to clarify that, at least in the cases of the surveys I was talking about, it is these are being done network-wide. Yes? Uh, one of the initiatives that's ongoing in the network is the patient-directed um, phenotyping. So there are some projects that are underway to evaluate um, when patients themselves provide the phenotyping um, to the clinician and then potentially to the sequencing um, cores as well, and to compare that to um, physician-directed phenotyping. And I think that that's one resource that could be um, a very useful tool going forward. Um, because, you know, with the medical record, sometimes you see errors in the medical record and they get propagated from physician to physician. So I think that if patients um, have the tools to phenotype themselves and that can be used um, going forward in their evaluations, that might be a, a very useful tool to come out of the network. I got the impression from Bill, though, that those, they often diagnose something that really isn't there or that's not objective, it's actually subjective, so that that could be a problem. But I think this section is really aimed at what are the families going through and how do we understand that better? So I think one can do surveys and questionnaires and analysis and interviews and what you'll find out is that having a diagnosis, having no diagnosis really sucks. So tell me how that's beneficial for us to sort of provide granularity to that, unless we're going to treat. I mean, because I, I, I'm sure people can do research on that and say, oh yeah, it sucks in this way or sucks in that way, <laughs> you know. But we have seen about 1,000 patients, 103 of them are dead. Should we be pursuing, you know, things that as distant sites, as consultants, <clears throat> we can't actually follow up on well? You know, the care of our patients with, in terms of uh, genetic counseling as well as, as um, psychological counseling has to be done by the local physicians. So we can learn more about, you know, the extent of this, et cetera. But we really need, th th these families need care for that. And uh, some of them need to have a diagnosis so they're not among our 10 percent that are dead. So Bill, just to give you a, a, a little bit of uh, pushback, in death and dying, there's a process you go through. And not having a diagnosis and then getting one but not having anything to do with it, I would guess there's also, you know, rejection, acceptance, and then working with the problem. And it, Having studied that sufficiently that you can say we know this is a process might be useful to those families coming to terms with, living with, okay, we got a diagnosis, but it didn't help us at all. And that mom and dad or wife and um, mother-in-law do that at different times in different ways. So that's just to kind of put it out there. And, and maybe studying that you know, in these next five years, for example, might provide some best practices to those clinicians um, 
out there? Because I, I agree, I think that there has to be, as in the earlier session, some transition of care. And I think this would be an important um, aspect of that care is the psychological support that the patient and family needs. And, but maybe we don't really understand what those needs are, and this would be an opportunity to figure some of that out. Donna? Well, I, I just would like to make a pitch for helping the families with the what next pro problem rather than trying to figure out where they're at in, in a way like what so I want the diagnosis or I didn't get one and what's next and I really think that if we're gonna think about patient engagements and the sustainability of this whole process even when it leaves here then it has to be what's what next there it can't just end there it has to be what's next and it's not always in the hands of the primary care person it's in the hands of the people and they have to be taught what's next and how to do that yeah so i was going to uh, second that and that a lot of it comes from empowerment you know and so yeah while it may be friction in in some of these interactions um but uh, if you empower the local clinicians through the collaborations that we talked about in the last session uh, or whether it's the patient advocacy groups um, if they give something that they can do with the information we provide them, then, then in, my, in my book it's been successful. Um, whether it's with an actual diagnosis and this is what you need to do, or we didn't get a diagnosis but this is what you need to do, um, and this is what we will do or continue to do, I think that really matters. Brandon? So following up on that comment, I think uh, that's exactly correct. If you think about the history of patient advocacy and, and rare disease, you know, it starts with the diagnosis, the clustering of families and then the focus on understanding natural history and then ultimately driving, often by families, therapies. And there are many excellent examples of this over the past three decades. So I think where we're at is um, when you think about undiagnosed disease or you're dealing with the rare, rare diseases. And so probably the first step is, in fact, the diagnosis. And then maybe really what we can do is bring those families together to start them on this journey. Which well, in this day and age of the internet, right? It's and actually, I think there are some programs yeah. like that that might, you know, might. Uh, and in a constructive way, I just want to point out in passing, the patients are the lobbyists. I mean, the families can get stuff, um, can lobby for things, so that you can then go on with programs and research and everything. Well, this is where I think um, what Bill was saying about seeing one patient and then selecting others additionally to begin that clustering mm. is extremely important because otherwise you never leave the end of one problem and then we don't solve any of these uh, right. situations. Yes. So I'm sure it varies from individual to individual. I imagine most of the patients that are coming into the network have received a diagnosis, but it may be a syndromic diagnosis. You have epilepsy, for example. And for many, many patients with epilepsy, that's the answer, and they don't need anything more. And for others, they need to know why. And once they get the answer why, very often then the, answer, then the next step of what do I do about it is, aside from genetic counseling and family planning perhaps, is, well, you know, keep taking the same medicines you're taking because this is how we treat epilepsy. So I think that, it, you know, each, each category of disease probably has different experiences. I think there is some value in figuring that out, but I imagine most of the people coming into this network are those who are not satisfied with you have anemia or you have epilepsy, but, but uh, you know, really want to know something. You said, who, whose fault is it? And that's what they really want to know is whose fault is this? So some people do, and, and some people want to do, as Donna suggested, just give me my plan. And it's going to be very different. And so, I mean, personally, I would advocate for trying to find some ways to separate them out, maybe having five different kinds of sheets you hand out as you go out the door to see which ones work best for which kinds of patients. Um, because I think they can be separated into the guilt room, the we're not going to lose face here, the I'm just action-oriented, I think there are distinctions, and they change over time. Yes. So a role that NORD has historically played is for when patients are first diagnosed with a rare disease, they come to us and they say, you know, what, what do I do? Who do I go talk to? 
And then we say, well, there are these three foundations out there that advocate for your specific disease. You can talk to this person here if you're looking for clinical trials or looking for a specific clinician that uh, might be an expert within your disease. And those organizations exist for, I guess, the, the well-known rare diseases. But for an individual who's leaving the undiagnosed disease program with a diagnosis, they might be the only individual with that diagnosis. There is no patient organization for them. There is no expert out there who can say, this is the clinician that you should go to. These are the clinical trials that you might possibly be, um, po possibly be uh, qualified for, among other things. And so those, but these undiagnosed patients who are now newly diagnosed, possibly as the only patient, still deserve those same answers. And so I suppose it falls to either a patient organization such as NORD in order to try to help, to help them or organizations such as UDN, UDP, to work with organizations such as NORD to kind of coordinate that process of transitioning patients outside, out of the UDP to organizations such as NORD or others. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> um, where there may not be a clinician because there is no diagnosis. But lots of folks around this room are clinical geneticists, and, and this is what we deal with all the time, where you suspect a genetic basis for the condition, maybe because of family history or a certain constellation of findings. So I wonder if kind of networking with clinical genetics expertise across the country, across the world, um, as a way to help facilitate that transition back to, you know, the other healthcare providers involved on that patient's team. Maybe the clinical geneticist should be the, the medical home for that patient with that undiagnosed disease. So we are running out of time. I don't see any hands that are just absolutely want to speak out. And if I can summarize, it looks as if this issue of how patients and families go home could be looked at and that perhaps different approaches in different parts of the network might lead us to have a better sense. And that the overall, pro in this age of participatory research, um, to have some sort of advisory group, not necessarily on the steering group, but some kind of advisory group that could give some feedback about how best to do that. Partnering with organizations like NORD and the Alliance that already exist, partnering with known um, to support groups who fit best, even though they're not perfect, um, give some opportunities for things to think about um, for the future. And I think that's it.